Let's go straight to Downing Street. Matt Hancock. Good afternoon and welcome to Downing Street for the daily coronavirus briefing. Uh, in keeping with the new format, um, I'll go through the slides now and then we'll take questions from members of the public and from journalists. Uh, if we first go to slide one. Slide one shows the testing capacity and the number of uh, new cases. Um, the, um, the slide, the top chart in the slide shows the number of tests. And that number of tests as of uh, the 2nd of June was 135,643. This is different to testing capacity, which stands at just over 200,000. And as I said yesterday, this demonstrates that there is spare capacity in testing. And so if you have symptoms of coronavirus, that's a, a fever, or a new dry cough, or a change in your sense of taste or smell, then please do go and get a test from nhs.uk forward slash coronavirus or by phoning 119. It's incredibly important that we can trace the, the virus by ensuring that anybody with symptoms has a test. And of course, we're rolling out testing across uh, care homes uh, and making sure that staff in hospitals get the opportunity to be tested as well. Uh, the bottom uh, chart on the slide shows the number of confirmed cases. Uh, this is uh, 1,613 as of, again, the 2nd of June, and brings the total of number of cases uh, confirmed in the UK to 277,985. And although the 1,613 figure is slightly higher than yesterday, we can see that the seven-day rolling average continues to fall. Second slide, please. The data from hospitals show that those uh, new admissions to hospitals in England has fallen to 436. Uh, this is down from 471 um, on the 24th of May, so uh, just over a week ago, and down from a high of 3,121 on the 2nd of April. This figure of 436 admissions to hospitals in England uh, with COVID-19 is the lowest figure since the 20th of March. And it demonstrates once again that we are making progress against this disease. Again, as yesterday, then the proportion of mechanical ventilators uh, ventilated beds that are occupied by patients with corona coronavirus uh, remains at 9%. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just like um, yesterday, the number of people in hospital continues to fall. 7,607 are now in hospital with coronavirus, and that is falling uh, in, broadly falling in each part of uh, the country, uh, but for a little bit of day-to-day -day movement in some of the areas, for instance, as you can see right at the end of the chart for the Northeast and Yorkshire, uh, but uh, we keep that very closely under review, but the overriding trend, as you can see, is downwards. Uh, the next slide is the number of uh, deaths, and sadly, on the, uh, on the 2nd of June yesterday, 324 deaths with coronavirus were recorded, taking the total to 39,369. And we mourn each one of these. And we try to keep these data as accurate as possible, including where we find in, in the past, um, those the, the, in some cases there are deaths where we discover that there has been a connection to coronavirus, and we add those uh, into those, uh, those data. So we can see that, the, again, the trend is broadly down, uh, but there is still some way to go. Uh, and uh, after the weekend effect, which we've seen each weekend in terms of the number of deaths recorded, because this is according to the date these are recorded, we've seen that rise on, a, uh, on, on, a, on most Mondays. Um, and sadly, the figure is 324 today. Next slide, final slide, please. Um, the, uh, the final slide reports on data from the Office for National Statistics, which was reported this morning. 
uh, and reported a total of 48,106 deaths in the UK where COVID-19 was mentioned on the death certificate. Uh, and you can see that this, again, this number is falling. The, the top chart uh, in shows those, those data um, and shows where we were on the recorded daily deaths uh, data for the period that corresponded to these data coming from the ONS. On the bottom chart, we can see the place of occurrence of those deaths, and you can see that both the number of deaths and the proportion of deaths that are in care homes, both of those are falling. 27.3% of deaths occurred in care homes in the latest ONS data to the week, the week of the uh, May the 22nd, bringing the proportion overall of deaths in care homes down to 32.5%. Um, we, um, we don't capture in these charts, but we do capture in a report published by Public Health England today, uh, further data, some of which are uh, much more troubling. Um, the PHE investigation into the way in which the virus targets people unequally and disproportionately uh, has been uh, put on the website. And this is a particularly timely publication because right across the world, people are angry about racial injustice. And I get that. Black lives matter. And I want to say this to everyone who works in the NHS and in social care. I value the contribution that you make, everybody equally. And I want to say it right across society too. I want to thank you and I want you to know that our whole country cares about your well-being. And I value too those who come to our country to work in the NHS and in social care. And I love that this country is one of the most welcoming and tolerant and diverse. That goes for the whole country and it goes especially for the health and care system. As I said in the House of Commons earlier, PHE's investigation found that age is the biggest risk factor for coronavirus. Next, gender. Living in a city is a risk and being black or from a minority ethnic background is also a significant risk factor. There is much more work to do to understand what's driving these disparities and how the different risk factors interact. And we are absolutely determined to get to the bottom of this and find ways of closing that gap. And I'm delighted that Kemi Badnock, the Minister for Equalities, will be taking this work forward, working with PHE and many others. We value the contribution from everyone to fighting this virus. Everyone has a contribution to make. And of course, the thing that every single person can do is to make their personal contribution to fighting this virus. In the first instance, things as simple as washing your hands, following the social distancing rules, and of course, if you have symptoms, please self-isolate immediately and get tested to protect your friends and family. So let's keep going and we'll get through this. We'll now turn to questions. The first questions are from members of the public. And the first one is from Danny from Huddersfield. Danny. Over the last week, a number of measures have been relaxed. If the R rate now begins to increase because of this, how will you identify which measures need to be reintroduced to bring it back under control? Well, that is a really important question. I'll ask John to come in in a second. Um, the package of measures that we've taken, we judge to be uh, safe. But of course, it depends on how people behave. And so it's important that people uh, follow the social distancing guidelines, even as they're changed. Um, we'll keep it under review. We then, if we need to make changes, we can either make them at a national level or a local level. And that will be determined by where we see any uh, outbreaks if we see them. Uh, and then at a national level, we can look, we can look at right across the board. Uh, but our, and of course, we've been clear from the start that if we need to, we will bring in further measures. But we have chosen these measures in order to be able to relax some of the most stringent parts of the lockdown whilst also keeping people safe. John. Yes, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, I think the answer, Danny, is that it would depend on how the uh, virus was coming back. Um, 
key to any public health control, and particularly for this virus, is the surveillance uh, information that we have, uh, including special surveys, but also routine surveillance, for example, from general practice. Um, so if, it was, uh, if the virus came back in a particular setting, whether it was a healthcare setting or, or perhaps in, um, in uh, a prison or whatever, then you can undertake a lot of testing and infection control in that setting. If it comes back more widely in particular groups, then there would be different measures that could be taken. Um, so it would, be a, it would be in response to the way in which uh, the epidemiology, the counts of the numbers of cases uh, were increasing. Uh, it seems likely, from the experience of other countries, that uh, if we do get uh, recrudescence, which is the technical term of the virus, uh, it would be patchy, it would be in, in localised areas. And that's why we are keeping that un under very close control. Thank you. Thanks very much, Danny. The next question is a written question from Barbara from Bridport. And Barbara asks, when will those members of the general public who suspect that they may have had COVID-19 be able to have an antibody test and how will this be rolled out? Um, well, this is another great question, Barbara. Uh, the answer is that in the first instance, the antibody tests are being used by those in the health and social care sector. We are delivering around 40,000 a day across the NHS and social care, and just over 40,000 a day on the latest uh, figures. Um, and then we'll roll them out uh, across the country. Um, the, we haven't yet been able to pin down the science of whether having antibody means that you are uh, at lower risk of getting the infection again and critically at lower risk of transmitting the virus. We've got tests in the field to find that out. So we will be rolling out uh, antibody tests more broadly and we've bought a, a huge number of them to be able to do that. Um, they, they, they involve a phlebotomist being able to take blood so that you can analyse that blood, uh, which means that we've got to roll them out at the pace that we are, and we're trying to expand the rate at which we roll them out, because I, I entirely understand your yearning to know. Thanks very much. Uh, questions from the media. If we go to Rihanna Croxford from the BBC. Rihanna. Thank you, Secretary of State. Many people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds will be confused why it has taken six weeks for the government to simply confirm what studies have already shown, that they're dying with COVID-19 at significantly higher rates. Deaths from all causes in this period have been up to four times higher on average for people from these backgrounds, and this hasn't been fully explained by today's review. Firstly, how can you explain this disparity, which hasn't just been caused by the virus, and why haven't you done more to protect and support these communities? And if I could also please have a response from Professor Newton. And secondly, on behalf of a colleague, you've been criticised by the stats watchdog for the presentation of the virus testing figures. Isn't that embarrassing over such an important policy area? Thanks very much. Um, I will, if I just address the second question first, uh, and then I will, both John and I, I'm sure, will uh, answer on the first, which is so important. On the, uh, on the second question, um, the, the, uh, the way that we present the stats is the best that we can in the, uh, having built the testing programme so rapidly over such a short period of time, uh, we are working with the stats authorities to be able to, to present these statistics in a way that they're happy with uh, and to make sure that we're as transparent as possible. Uh, I spoke to Sir David Norgrove today, who, uh, who is the the head of UK Statistics Authority, uh, and we'll be working with them to make sure that these statistics are, uh, are constantly improved. Uh, but uh, the way that we present them is, the, is the, the simplest way of presenting a very complex uh, picture of the overall five different pillars uh, of testing, and that's the approach that we've taken. Uh, on the first part of your question about the report from Public Health England, you know, I, I, I think this is an incredibly important area. I've been really struck by the, 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 the clear difference in the proportion of people who are dying with COVID-19 uh, from ethnic minority backgrounds, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. So I asked Public Health England to do this work uh, by the end of May. They've done that. But you're absolutely right that there's much more work that needs to be done, and this report shows that. So we're asking, I've asked the Equalities Minister, uh, Kemi Badnock, to take this forward and to look into the, the causes 
and what further can be done. And, uh, and Professor Newton's been involved in this work from the start. Yeah, so thank you. I mean, I mean, just on the reporting of the statistics, um, it's worth bearing in mind the objective of the testing programme was to build a capacity of, test, of tests to respond to the pandemic. Um, and it's really what we do with the tests rather than the numbers which, are, which matter. So at the moment, we have a, a falling number of infections. Um, and what we're really keen to do is to have really high quality testing that's delivered quickly and, and uh, very available. So um, the, uh, the, actually just the numbers of tests isn't a measure of how effective the programme is. It's this, whether we're testing the right people, testing them quickly and getting the results back. So uh, we're happy to report the numbers in any way, uh, in any way that, uh, that, we're, that we're asked to. Um, on, on the review is, a, is an important piece of work. Um, uh, there was a great deal in it, uh, a lot of different factors looked at. Normally, a report like this would take us a good six months. So we've actually produced uh, the sort of analysis that, that in, in a relatively short time. Um, as you say, some of these data were already available. So the uh, Office of National Statistics and other research studies have already published. So we've confirmed that. And it's important to have confirmation from a number of sources. Um, as you say, uh, we weren't able to look at all the potential uh, explanations, but in particular, you mentioned the uh, all-cause mortality being four times higher, or actually 3.9 times higher in, in black men, for example, than, uh, uh, than in normal times. Uh, and it's raised by 1.7 1, 1 times in, in white men and, and two, I think, 2.9 uh, in Asian men. So there are a number of statistics in there. Uh, it's quite a long report, and there's a great deal of, of background information and detailed information that we think will be helpful. What we'd really like to do now is to get a lot of discussion about all these elements, with, in particular with a lot of the people involved and the various groups involved in responding to it. Uh, so we think the report will be helpful. Um, some of it was available before, but there's quite a lot of new information there. Uh, and it's not, it's not uh, easy to, uh, to go directly from the analysis to uh, making recommendations, and we need to uh, uh, get the report widely disseminated and widely discussed before, I think, deciding uh, exactly what needs to be done. But clearly, there are some fairly obvious conclusions that can be drawn even from the data that we have. Can Thank I you. please follow up on that? Yes, of course, yeah. Mm. But just saying, you know, firstly, thank you for acknowledging that Black Lives Matter in your opening speech, but lots of people are already going back to work, scared that they're not being protected. And there'll be no measures announced today, as we had expected, perhaps to be put in place to protect them. Can you say anything to these communities? And if not, can you give us a time frame or a deadline when they will get recommendations about how they can protect themselves going forward, considering that this risk won't be going away? Yes, absolutely. The number one thing I'd say is that for anybody in a higher risk group, the most important thing to do is stringently to follow the social distancing guides including the work on social distancing at work that's been published. So there is specific guidance for social distancing in the workplace. So for all of the different high-risk categories that the data demonstrate, it's really important that people uh, follow those social distancing guidelines uh, very stringently. You know, we've been very clear about this from the start, about um, those who either have a medical condition and as the PHE report says, age is the number one risk factor uh, because um, around 90% of deaths are amongst the over 65s. Um, so uh, the, 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 uh, the, answer, the direct answer to the question is, this, is the same as to everybody but with more emphasis, which is that the social distancing is the best way to keep yourself safe and keep others safe alongside the hygiene and washing your hands and making sure that if you have symptoms, get a test. And I totally understand the concerns that people have. Uh, and I understand the, um, uh, the anger that's, that people feel more about racial injustice more broadly. And I share it and we want to tackle it. We, I fully acknowledge that. And it is very, very important that we address that as I'm trying to do within the NHS and social care that I'm responsible for, and I think we need to do across society as a whole. Thanks very much, Rhiannon. Is that okay? Yeah. Emily Morgan from ITV. Hi. Um, if I can pick up on something that Rihanna said, you launched this review, Secretary of State, this review published today with a huge fanfare to look at how COVID-19 was affecting ethnic minorities. One of the objectives 
to the review was to make recommendations. Where are those recommendations and will you be publishing any anytime soon? Well, absolutely, we need to take, go through the next stage of work um, to make sure that we take into account all of the different considerations. For instance, the PHE report sets out that it doesn't take into account comorbidities, uh, different occupations, because different people in different occupations have different risk factors, um, and, of course, um, the um, uh, um, uh, health, other health factors like uh, obesity. We've got to make sure that all of those are taken into account and, and scientifically, rigorously understand the causes behind the, uh, the data that are clearly shown today and take that uh, and take the lessons from there. John? Well, yes, thank you. I mean, I think the recommendations are, there are recommendations there, but they're, they're perhaps, they're, they're more to do with the fact that these are important data for people to be aware of, because as Secretary of State has said, I think even understanding the levels of risk associated with different factors is itself important in designing uh, programs to protect people. And in fact, the NHS has already uh, started the process of risk assessment for staff using these sorts of data. So, so there, are, there are recommendations there, but um, there, is st there are still some questions. I mean, what we do show is that there's no simple, if you take, I mean, there's a lot more than just the uh, ethnic uh, differences in the report. There are differences to do with levels of deprivation and where people live and occupation and so on. And all these causes are the causes of, of health inequalities anyway. Mm -hmm. And actually what the report emphasizes is the fact that what COVID-19 has done is to emphasize the existing health inequalities in the country. Uh, and it shows us again that we need to address those inequalities, whether they're to do with deprivation or to do with people's, um, people's background. Um, so in fact, the, uh, to some extent, the, uh, the, the recommendations that have been made before about similar issues still apply. What we have uh, uh, what we have put forward is uh, some data that can be used. Uh, Secretary of State mentioned the, um, the, the, the relevant minister and the, uh, the race disparities unit who have already looked at the data. And I think we will be seeing some recommendations coming out. But it is important that those recommendations are widely discussed with a lot of other groups, not just from Public Health England. But we, we think the data are going to be important for those processes. Thanks. Just... Thank yes, of course, mm. yeah. You... You mentioned risk assessments, and obviously mm. risk assessments that are now happening for ethnic minority members of staff uh, in healthcare. But what about the rest of the population? Given yeah. that we know that ethnic minorities are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19, shouldn't all ethnic minorities now be put in an at-risk category to protect them? Well, if, if I may say, so, I mean, the, I mean, the, the key point of the of the study is it shows although clearly outcomes are worse for people in in uh, black and and uh, minority ethnic uh, groups. Uh, that is not necessarily because of their ethnicity, but exactly as you say, it may be t related to their occupation or to other, as other reasons why they might be at higher level of exposure. So do you, one just has to be a little bit careful uh, in, in doing that risk assessment. One has to look at the causes of increased risk, uh, which uh, may be as much to do with other factors uh, not necessarily someone's background per se, although it is, there is probably an element of that as well. So it just, it, the, the report, if nothing else, emphasises the complexity of what we're seeing. So really we're urging people not to jump to conclusions and, and institute, institute measures which are not really justified by the, by the data. So there's an element of caution in our, in our results as, as well as obviously pointing out these obvious inequalities. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, next question is from Ben Kentish at LBC. Ben. Thank you, Secretary of State. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask you about the ONS figures this morning, because mm. two months or so ago, at the start of the lockdown, the government was predicting a death toll of between 7,000 and 20,000. The ONS this morning revealing that the total excess mortality since the end of March is three times that, and more than three times that, at about 62,000. I wondered if you had any... Um, a sense of why you thought that was and therefore what lessons we could learn about that for the future. And if I could, just one for Professor Newton. Testing capacity has increased significantly, but still about a third of it each day is going unused. Just wondered how you plan to use that spare yeah. capacity and whether it could be used for people who have been told to isolate by the track and trace te test and trace system without symptoms to decide whether or not they do indeed have the virus. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks very much. Uh, on the first question, I'll take the first question and then ask uh, uh, Professor Newton to answer the second. Uh, on the first question, we didn't make a prediction of the impact of uh, this disease, other than right at the start when there were scientific predictions made which have been published showing uh, that unmitigated, with no measures, uh, the death toll would have been around half a million. Uh, and that led to a whole, um, a whole series of changes, including the social distancing uh, and effectively the lockdown, because that was unacceptably high. Um, and we are completely and fully uh, transparent about the, uh, the impact of the disease. Um, and I welcome the uh, ONS's uh, uh, vigilance in measuring it. Um, and um, it, the, you know, the good news from the ONS stats this morning are that the number of cases, uh, the number of deaths, sorry, is coming down, uh, and also the fact that the proportion of deaths in care homes is coming down, uh, given that that's been a, a, a very big focus of attention. Um, Professor Newton. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so it's a very good question about what are the priorities for the testing program. So there are three priorities. The first is to support the test and trace program. And the Secretary of State has said we are really keen for anybody with symptoms that might be coronavirus to come forward, have a test, and so that we can give a definitive answer. And if they are positive, they can be entered into the uh, test and trace program. And I should say, actually, we were asked yesterday about some of the statistics, but there are thousands of uh, people already who've positive, tested positive who've been successfully uh, fed into the test and trace program, and they have uh, been using, their, using the online tool and identifying contacts, and there are thousands of contacts who've been successfully identified and agreed to uh, self-isolate. So that program is going well. We don't, in fact, recommend testing for people who don't have symptoms, because if you, uh, if you don't have symptoms, it is unlikely to be positive, and even if somebody who's incubating the virus, the test may well be negative. So if you have, an, if you have a test uh, during, um, uh, if you're a contact and during your 14 days of self-isolation, if you have a test and it's negative, you still have to complete the 14 days isolation. So there is, there is um, little utility in, in offering tests to people who are contacts unless they develop symptoms when of course it is worthwhile. The second um, priority is to support the NHS in infection control and other settings like care homes. So we're doing a lot of testing of staff uh, to make sure that it's safe for people to be uh, in a care setting or in the NHS. So that's a substantial requirement. Um, the numbers of positive tests, and particularly asymptomatic positive tests in those settings, are coming down. So it, and we are learning from those results to design uh, infection control programs for the future. And then thirdly, we're using the test to support really large-scale surveys. So every now and again, you see a blip in the numbers of tests done when, uh, when we do a lot of tests for a survey, whether it's for the Office of National Statistics or one of the other, the Imperial College survey or so on. So those are the three priorities for testing. Um, and uh, we are using a good proportion of the tests. And of course, then there are the antibody tests, which are being rolled out first in health and care staff to understand how the infection has spread. Um, but Can thank I just you. come back on your answer, Secretary of State? Yeah, of course, yeah. Thank you, because there, there, were, there were forecasts published by members of SAGE, Neil Ferguson, for example, and he said today that the UK had been much more heavily affected by the virus than expected. So I did wonder if there was any analysis going on and if you could share any of that about why that might be and how we could avoid, if there was a second peak or a future epidemic, how we can avoid those same things happening again. Well, it's undoubtedly true that we've had a very significant impact from this virus. There's no doubt about that. And we've been learning all the way through it how best to, uh, to deal with that. In fact, the test and trace system that uh, we've built over the past few weeks and that's been up and running for the past five days is one of the lessons that comes out of it, the absolute vital importance of having a system that is big enough uh, to be able to, uh, to, um, uh, to trace as many of those who've po tested positive as possible. And this, in fact, ties in with a... Uh, an additional answer I was going to give to your second question, which is that uh, Professor Newton gave the long answer, if you like. The short answer to the question of the gap between tests done and capacity is that we have spare capacity. This is a good thing, but I would urge LBC listeners and everybody else in the country to use the capacity if they need it. If you need a test, you can get one uh, straightforwardly, go on the website, uh, and you are not only protecting yourself, but you're also uh, helping us to trace the virus 
and uh, control it and therefore uh, keep the country safe. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, George Parker from the FT. George. Thank you. It's a question about the government's plan for a blanket quarantine, a 14-day quarantine on people arriving from overseas. Question, first of all, to Professor Newsom: What is the scientific rationale for having a quarantine against people coming in, for example, from a country like Greece, which has very low levels of coronavirus into this country? And would you support the idea of an air bridge between countries with lower infection, infection rates than Britain into the UK? And a question to you, Secretary of State. You said on May the 12th, that people wouldn't be taking overseas holidays this year. Is that still your advice? Uh, well, do you want to go first? Uh, well, I should say, by the way, that I'm not a member of SAGE, and it would be SAGE whose advice is, is the basis for this. But the principles are, are clear that, um, obviously, we, uh, just like uh, in this country, if somebody might be at risk of having the virus, we need them to be isolated uh, during any period when they might be uh, infectious. And if people are coming into the country, then they already have to be treated as an unknown, uh, and therefore there's a quarantine. Now, if uh, well, there are two reasons why we might not do that. That would be if the risk of them having the virus uh, when they come from another country is so low that we would just take the chance, that the chances of them being, becoming infectious are very low. Uh, and I think at the moment the judgment is that it's too early to say that, and therefore it's better to be cautious for people travelling. Um, and secondly, if we were, uh, if we are able to very quickly respond uh, with a, a test and trace program, uh, then we could cover it in that way. So if we, if travellers are able to um, uh, be tested and self-isolate in response to, uh, in response to uh, contact tracing, just like, uh, a, a, if you like, a, a domestic new case, then that would also be a, um, an, a way of dealing with it. At the moment, I think. Caution is won the day, and uh, Sage's advice is that quarantine is, is appropriate. But as I say, it's not my direct responsibility, but I th I'm sure those are the principles on which, on which the advice is being given. Uh, thanks, George. On the specifics, I, I was actually asked this, uh, I think, uh, late last week, and I said I was more optimistic uh, than previously. Uh, but clearly, the number one priority is keeping the public safe. And um, that, is, that is the overriding principle. Uh, and it has been throughout this, uh, and uh, hence many of the changes that we've brought in. The next question is from I Sarah O'Grady. Yes, of course. Sorry, I, sorry. You want to come back? Sorry, can I just quick follow up on that? Sure. Um, given that the UK has one of the highest infection rates in Europe, can you give any indication of which other European countries are interested in the idea of an air bridge with the UK? Well, this air bridge idea has been uh, floated, uh, and uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion about it, and I know that some countries have been mentioned in the media, um, but that is a piece of work that's being done by the Home Office and the DFT, uh, and um, I'm not going to tread on the toes of my colleagues, no matter how tempting it is. Um, thanks, George. Um, the next question is from Sarah O'Grady uh, from the Daily Express. Sarah. Hello there. My question is to you, Secretary of State. Um, the spotlight has shone on the pressures faced by our social care system through this um, coronavirus pandemic like never before. And I would like to know, please, so I can tell readers of the Daily Express, what are your plans and what is your time frame for the long promised radical reform of social care? Well, I'm, I'm glad to say, Sarah, that we absolutely need to make those reforms to social care that have been, in my view, uh, pushed to the side for too long. Uh, we made clear commitments in the manifesto, which was only back in December, and we have been working on that, uh, on that piece of work even during the coronavirus crisis. It's incredibly important to me that we put social care on a sustainable footing. And I think one of the positive things amid the, uh, the terrible things that have happened during this crisis is that people have recognised social care as for just how important it is. And I think everybody who works in social care has seen the whole country value them. We need to follow that up with reforms to the way that social care is supported to make sure that more people get that dignity in their older age and the people of working age who are in social care get the support that they need. So I am I'm very 
Um, I'm, I am very keen to, I, I'm, I'm determined to push forward the social care reforms that I know so many readers of the Daily Express are, are interested in. Can you give me an example, please, of one of those reforms? Could you well, give us an idea of perhaps the time frame? Well, the time frame has been um, clear, which is that we've got to get these reforms done um, in this parliament, and the Prime Minister has previously said that we'd uh, get them uh, set out this year. That was before coronavirus. We'll still try to do that, but it is not straightforward. Um, and um, what I can say is that the crisis itself has demonstrated many of the reforms that are needed, like closer working and co collaboration between health and social care, like the uh, in like increased financial support, which we'd, which we'd already committed to for social care, and then we put more in uh, during the crisis, and making sure that some of the injustices in social care are taken away, uh, especially about how it's paid for. Thanks very much. The final question is from uh, uh, Vic Machun from The Voice. Vic. Secretary of State, many thanks. Um, I'd like to ask two questions, if I may, and address them also to uh, Mr Newton. Uh, given the disproportionate way in which COVID-19 has affected people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, there's understandably a lot of concern, a lot of anticipation about this report, the Public Health England report, and what it might say. However, the disappointing lack of recommendations is, is certainly going to um, you know, affect many. Uh, already we've had a number of uh, emails from readers of The Voice citing this as another example of government indifference to the kind of inequalities that you mentioned earlier on in your address. How will the government um, address and reassure members of those communities that this isn't just another report? The second question I'd like to ask, as you know, the statistics show a clear link between the um, uh, people working in um, public uh, frontline communities, uh, frontline jobs, and also their chances of um, contracting COVID-19. Uh, many people from BME communities are in frontline jobs such as health, healthcare, transport, social care. But local authorities around the country have been very quick to protect BME employees through things like risk assessments. How will the government follow their lead? Well, thanks very much, Vic. And I, I, in a way, the second, question, the second question answers the first in that we've already taken action because it's been clear right from the start. You know, I remember that the first four deaths of doctors were all people from uh, uh, black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds um, I, think they, uh, I think three of the four had uh, come to the UK to serve in the NHS, um, and it really struck me, and this was right at the start, um, that there was clearly a disparity, and we've seen that disparity. And I think in your second question, you've touched on some of the reasons, and we need to, we need to do more work, which is why we've published this and are saying we're, doing, we're taking it further. Um, because the link to the occupations that, that people do is an important part of this conundrum. Um, and putting in place risk assessments for people who are in high-risk occupations has been something that we've already been doing uh, the work on. What we need to find out, and we don't yet know from this report, is what over and above the impacts of being in a certain occupation, like, for instance, as you say, being more uh, on the uh, front line, and one of the biggest impacts is of, pe is of people who work in transport, where you can't isolate, so like taxi drivers, um, and how much of the disproportionate uh, 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 number of deaths that we've seen from people from BME communities are due to the, uh, the fact that there's a higher proportion of um, people from those communities who work in the sorts of occupations where uh, the risk is greater, um, and how much is down to, uh, for instance, the, um, uh, the di differences in, uh, in housing, because we know that urban areas are more badly hit than rural areas. And so it's the wider co-determinants that we need to get to the bottom of. And that's the work that, uh, along with uh, PHE, that Kemi Badnock will be leading in the next stage to make sure we, we look as broadly as possible. And 
all the way through this, we've been putting in place the actions that we think have been needed from the evidence that we've got, um, and, and, and we, we need to keep doing that. John. Well, thank you, Secretary. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so the, the purpose of the report was to try and get every bit of information we could from the existing data, try and understand how the different factors work together. So not, not just uh, ethnicity, but the other factors which are often working alongside ethnicity. And many people, of course, suffer from multiple disadvantages as well. Um, so we're trying to put all that into, into context and, and really present it as clearly as we could and it is complicated even after we've done the analyses it is still a complicated picture so trying to get that absolutely clear so that people could then take it forward and develop the right recommendations and I think you know, there's a um, the, the way we would the way we would do this is uh, it, it is such a way that the people who uh, we're really trying to put the information into the hands of people who can use it to make a difference and that's often it's not us as the public health authority it's more likely the you know the pe people that, that you, you work with and know who will know how to use these data to make a difference to people's lives um, so there's a whole range of people who need to contribute to these recommendations certainly not just us as public health england uh, so we, we presented we've done the very best we can to understand what the data tell us already there are some things that we still don't know from the data and there's a research program that um, has been kicked off to try and, try and elucidate some, some of the genetic analyses and some we haven't done yet. But we've, we've done the very best we can to make those data available to people so that really, really good recommendations can be developed, which will really make a difference to the outcome. But, but thank, thank you. Thanks. Have you got a... Uh, yeah, yeah. If, I, if I may ask, so you mentioned that there will be a follow-up uh, report and inquiry. Do you have any timelines as to when that follow-up report, you mentioned it will be headed by Kemi Badenoch. Do you have any timelines as to when that might be? Obviously, the concern on this issue is that, you know, given the scale of the issue, it's just report after report. And obviously, there are many people in BME communities who really want to see some serious action and some serious recommendations yeah, I, look, I get that yearning, and um, uh, we will put action in place uh, as soon as we can. We won't wait for a report. Um, I've got to talk to Kemi about a timeline for it, and so I'll have to get back to you on that one. But I totally understand the, the urgency, the importance, and, uh, and the sensitivity of getting this right. Thanks, Vic. Thank you very much indeed. That ends today's uh, Downing Street Coronavirus Daily Briefing. See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.